Hello, good morning, and welcome to At Home with the Zen Gateway. Um, we're going live again. Uh, this is our second broadcast, uh, as we are sort of um, at this period now where we thought it would be a good idea uh, to put something a little bit live for people who are perhaps at home. My name is Martin Goodson, and I'm co-founder of the uh, of the Zen Gateway. I'm going to just um, leave it a minute or so. I think uh, we wanted. I want to just wait uh, and see who joins. Um, if you can see and hear me, that would be great. It, either press the like button or just put see and hear in the comment box below. Uh, and that just lets me know this isn't sort of disappearing into the, uh, into the ether. Okay, we've got a like. Excellent. I think that's Anders. Hello, Anders. I hope you're okay. Just give another 30 seconds. If you're watching this on the um, uh, recorded, um, then uh, you can just scroll forward a minute or two probably uh, probably save you anyway just to um, uh, just as sort of preface we are looking again at an extract from the wisdom of the Zen masters this is by Ermgard Schlegel uh, which was the preordination name of the venerable Myokioni and um, uh, here we've uh, uh, got another selection and today we're going to be looking at Master Rinzai and uh, or a passage from uh, that she quotes from Master Rinzai and um, Master Rinzai is of course uh, the Japanese name for Lin Chi um, which is the Chinese name um, Lin Chi or Rinzai um, was a, a, a Zen master who lived and taught during the Tang Dynasty which uh, is the period of Chinese history from uh, the 6th to the 9th century and uh, this was known as the um, golden age of Zen, the great flowering of Zen. His teacher was, was Master Obaku, and uh, originally he started life as a Tendai monk, and, and in those days Tendai Buddhism um, was very much uh, a scholastic, uh, sort of what's known as a Vinaya school. Um, so Master Rinzai was very well versed in the teachings of the Buddha, uh, and in the rules, and in the Abhidharma, which is the uh, Buddhist psychology uh, that uh, expounds the teachings that are found in the uh, in the early canon in the early Pali canon. So that sort of places him in history, and obviously he's important because he's the founder of uh, one of these uh, still existing lineages of Zen, the Rinzai Zen School, um, of which uh, I, I'm a member also. So he's particularly important for for the school that I uh, that I belong to. So we'll get on and we'll, we'll have a look at this, uh, uh, this extract. Master Rinzai, in a sermon to his monks, quotes from the scriptures that the Buddha has supernormal powers and explains what they are. What we usually call supernormal powers are not the Buddhas. After all, the demon king, on losing a battle, made his whole host of fiends, 84,000 of them, vanish in the hollow stalk of a lotus. Would that make the demon king a Buddha? The Buddha's supernormal powers are the true ones, and only a Buddha possesses them. Seeing without being deceived by colour and form. Hearing without being deceived by sound. Smelling without being deceived by smells. Tasting without being deceived by tastes. Touching without being deceived by touch. And thinking without being deceived by mental configurations. So... This is a, a passage from what's known as the Rinzai Roku, which is uh, the record of Rinzai, as it's ordinarily known, a collection of sermons that were collected by his disciples. And uh, uh, this refers to, uh, well, as it says, the Buddha's uh, supernormal powers. And if, we, um, if we're familiar, particularly with the Mahayana Sutras, um, like the Lotus and uh, the Vimalakirti uh, and so forth, then we'll know that there are lots of stories where the Buddha you know, rises up into the air and um, uh, uh, sort of 
transforms uh, the world into a into a sort of diamond universe or a bejeweled universe. Uh, he transports people to other worlds and so forth. Um, and you know, we we may sort of look at these and sort of think these are all sort of rather fancy. Um, but of course, the idea of supernormal powers. Um, is is something that actually is familiar to us as well, or at least I would certainly argue that it is familiar to us, because when we look at it, what what are supernormal powers really? Well, they they're power basically. That they are powers that allow us to do something that perhaps ordinarily uh, we do not feel uh, we are capable of actually doing. Um, so, and if, if, for example, I mean, um, if you go and look online um, and go to the mind, body, spirit section, say of Amazon um, uh, or Waterstones or, or any of the others, you'll see that there's a that the um, virtual bookshelf is groaning under the weight of books that promise promise all sorts of uh, powers. You know how to overcome smoking, how to lose weight, how to win friends and influence people, how to get rich quick. Um, uh, uh, how to be successful at interviews, how to influence and persuade people around to your point of view, how to be the perfect lover. Um, you can get a book on, on just about anything and you know they will be full of techniques um, and, and, and techniques is, is really um, how we instrumentalize power. Um, it's how we exert power over the universe and there is this a um, uh, 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 notion in the exercise of power that in a way we sort of have to rise up uh, in order to exert power over something because that's we actually use it in the uh, in the phrase to to have power over something isn't it is to rise up and to uh, exert power over it um, and this is this is certainly one attitude we can take towards the world um, and perhaps you know I mean in a way if we go back to our own that, that is sort of Western foundation myths uh, of the creation of the world. You know, uh, in the Garden of Eden, God gave the power over the animals and over nature um, to Adam, uh, specifically, but uh, presumably Adam and Eve by extension. Um, uh, and that's a, a, a and, and in a way, you could say we've been doing that ever since. And also, in a way, uh, you can say that it's bred into us. Um, a feeling that somehow we are apart from the world, that, that we are sort of separate from nature. Uh, and nowadays people are sort of very aware of that, particularly with a lot of the concern around environmentalism um, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, that perhaps we have taken this, uh, we have treated the world too lightly. We have thought of ourselves in, in control of something that in fact we are not in control of. And I think that certainly uh, dovetails very much into the current crisis. You know, here we are um, facing a virus, for example, that has completely changed the way that all of us are living. Um, it's preventing us from doing things. It's causing us fear. Uh, it's causing us to be stuck inside our own homes. And, you know, we can't go out and even shake somebody's hand or even, even putting a hand on someone else's shoulder uh, can be seen as threatening now. Um, uh, uh, this is a backlash. This is this is a feeling that that, that somehow we do not have power um, that we thought we have in the world, and this this always comes as a shock to I. This always comes as a surprise uh, uh, to the ego, um, and this is why it create it creates fear in us. And, and naturally, when we're frightened of something, we want to seek control. Being frightened means that we feel out of control. And there's a nice story about um, uh, a samurai general who um, in his entourage uh, he had two advisors one was a, a Buddhist monk and the other one was a Taoist magician uh, and uh, the Taoist magician was uh, somewhat jealous of the Buddhist monk because he really did have the general's ear and uh, he, he wanted to usurp him so he came up with a plan and, and one day as they were um, going along uh, they came to a waterfall and the Taoist magician turned to the general and said uh, let me show you something sir uh, and he walked up to the waterfall he made a magical pass and he stepped through the curtain of water and then he stepped back out of it and he was bone dry absolutely dry and this was miraculous 
uh, and the general was deeply impressed and he turned to the uh, to the Buddhist monk and says and what about you uh, and the Zen monk sort of or the Buddhist monk sort of shrugged his shoulders uh, jumped down off his uh, off his horse um, and went up to the uh, curtain of water and stepped through it and then stepped back out of it and he was drenched absolutely dripping wet and laughing and the general who thought he was laughing at him was already calling for his um, uh, uh, one of his senior officers to come and take the uh, 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 cheeky monk's head off um, which was quite normal in those days um, and and the monk said and so you see sire if you walk through water you get wet uh, and whilst it may be so that some may have a magical power uh, to stop you getting wet uh, when it really comes to it at the end of your life no one will escape death uh, and so the wisdom that I teach uh, is the wisdom to discover in oneself the strength to face these things and this has always been very much at the heart of Buddhism and I remember Ermgard Schlegel, Venerable Myokyo, um, uh, once saying in, in one of her talks, she said the difference that she had noticed, and she spent 12 years training in Japan, she said the difference that she had found between uh, the general sort of underlying attitude, uh, West and East, um, is that, um, it, it, uh, she said, can be summed up if you imagine a man sitting in a cold room. You know, if the man was a Westerner, he would go out and invent central heating. Uh, but if he's from the East, um, he would ask himself, who is it that feels cold? And she said those, those two orientations, one is an outward one into the world that seeks to change the world. Uh, but she said uh, in Buddhism, the orientation is inward. It, it's about looking inward and discovering one's own resilience, discovering one's own internal power. Um, and, uh, 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 sorry, so <laughs> you can tell it's live. Um, you, can discover, uh, you, you can discover that power uh, that's there. Um, and this is what Buddhism has always been about. This is why uh, it's always had that sort of orientation and why when it comes to supernormal powers, there's always been an acknowledgement of it. Um, and again, this is not about, you know, whether you believe in magic or whether you don't believe in magic. We're talking about power and exerting power in the world. But always in Buddhism, there has been that inner awareness to know where that motivation comes from. Because in Buddhism, motivation is, is 100% uh, what it's about. If we do not understand why we do the things that we do, um, then we are living in ignorance, and that ignorance is a video, uh, is the cause of our suffering. It's the beginning of the 12 link, ch uh, 12 link chain of arising due to conditions. So Master Renzai in his sermon to the monks quotes from the scriptures and explains that the Buddha has supernormal powers and explains what they are. And he gives the example, after all, the demon king on losing a battle uh, made his whole host of fiends, 84,000 of them, vanish in the hollow stalk of a lotus. Uh, and what he's referring to here is, uh, is a story um, of um, uh, the god uh, Shakya, who was uh, king of the gods in uh, Hindu cosmology, um, who battled the great demon. Uh, and on defeating the demon, uh, the demon and his 84,000 troops um, appeared to vanish, but actually they hadn't. They just shrunk themselves very small uh, and were now hiding um, inside the stalk uh, of a lotus stem. And this is a, you know, this is a classic act of magic that we find in myths uh, and legends and fairy tales uh, uh, from, from all over the place. Um, and these are the things that have, this is why, you know, this is why these things fascinate us because in ourselves, we feel a lack. We, we feel that somehow um, unless we uh, unless we have this power, uh, then the fear is that the world will overcome me. So we, there's always this dichotomy. There's me and the world. This is the classic duality um, uh, the, that the Buddha said was an illusion because um, that I, he said, is I uh, is the delusion of I. Um, 
And this is why, also, this is the deeper meaning to that story about the Buddhist monk and the Taoist magician, that actually what the, uh, what the Buddhist monk was showing was that, in fact, that strength that is already innate in us, it's the strength and power of the Buddha nature, um, is part of the world. It's part of the same world and shares the same nature as, uh, uh, as the waterfall, as the world around us, as, uh, as other people. And it functions as a part of that. And it's a, it's a different type um, of consciousness. And what prevents us realizing this, of course, it, uh, as far as the Buddha's uh, concerned, is that the sense bases, uh, the way we perceive the world, are obscured. They're obscured by delusion. And this is the second part of uh, the quote from uh, Master Rinzai. The Buddha's supernormal powers, he says, are the true ones, and only a Buddha possesses them. But don't forget, which Buddha is he talking about? Because um, the Buddha um, in Mahayana is not just the historical Buddha who lived and died two and a half millennia ago. Um, the Buddha is also a shorthand for the Buddha nature, which all beings have. As the Buddha himself said in the Northern tradition, how wonderful, how miraculous all beings, but all beings are fully and completely endowed with the wisdom and the power of the Tathagata, the Tathagata being another name for the Buddha. Um, but sadly, because of their sticky attachments, human beings are not aware of it. So that Buddha that is speaking is actually the heart Buddha, which we were looking at last time. You know, that uh, heart mirror uh, and that heart Buddha. This is the, the voice of the innate Buddha nature. And again, in, in Mahayana, and the Zen school is, is part of the Mahayana, um, the Buddha nature is always functioning. The Buddha nature comes already pre-enlightened. Uh, it's already functioning, but it's obscured. That's the only difference. This is why there's analogies um, uh, uh, of the clouds obscuring the sun, but the sun is still shining. Um, even on the darkest of days, the sun is still bright and shining, uh, but it's obscured uh, uh, by those clouds. However, even on the darkest days, uh, some light does penetrate through. Uh, and this is important for us as well. We are in our practice of daily life practice, uh, and also in meditation, when we give ourselves wholeheartedly into what at this moment is being done, we are simultaneously emptying the heart out. Emptying the heart out of the notions of I, what I want, what I don't want, uh, what I think about things, my hopes and fears, etc. And in that space that remains, in that quiet spaciousness that remains, that light can be seen. Uh, and it's learning to recognize, listen to, and respond to uh, that voice, that light, uh, that pervading radiance of the Buddha nature. And so he goes on to describe what they are. Seeing without being deceived by colour and form. Hearing without being deceived by sound. Smelling without being deceived by smells. Tasting without being deceived by tastes. Touching without being deceived by touch. And thinking without being deceived by mental configurations. So. He goes through what are known as the six sense bases. So in Buddhism, there are the six senses. Um, there's uh, obviously the five physical ones that we are used to. Uh, and then there is the extra one, um, what's known as, um, uh, well, it's called uh, uh, manas, uh, mano. Um, it's the mind, uh, sometimes it's translated as. But we have to be careful because the English term mind means one thing, but in Buddhism, there are several terms that can be translated as mind. Um, and specifically, uh, what's being referred to here is um, the function of mind that recognizes, that cognizes uh, mental objects. So what are mental objects? Well, a thought is a mental object. An image is a mental object. A fantasy is a stream of mental objects. Um, an emotional state is also a stream of mental objects. Um, to wish for something, what's called volitions, uh, are also mental objects. But there are other mental objects as well. In fact, we experience sound and colours and forms and smells 
and so forth. These we experience them um, as mental objects. Um, outwardly in the world, of course, colors don't exist. Uh, colors exist because they're created through our conscious perceptions, through the act of seeing, which is a, a, an act of creation. Uh, what the uh, phenomenologist Edward Husserl called um, intentional. He said it was intentional. We don't say it's intentional, uh, but we do say that, that perceiving is an act of uh, creation. We don't, uh, uh, perception is not just passively taking in information. Uh, it's uh, uh, that information is organized. Uh, it's organized in forms. Um, so that we can recognize the difference between a table and a person um, or a fork and a knife which is sort of just as well and it's the same with sounds as well the sounds that we hear uh, do not exist um, in themselves they 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 have a counterpart that well sorry they exist in con they do exist they exist in consciousness but their worldly counterparts are vibrating air molecules um, in the same way that wavelengths of light are the physical counterpart of uh, conscious colors. And for example, this was something uh, back in the early days of Western science um, that was very important. It was a distinguishment, that it, was, it was something that was distinguished. Um, so, for example, when Sir Isaac Newton uh, produced a lot of work on optics, one of his great um, uh, uh, opus, uh, uh, magnum opus, was, was called optics. And, and what he did is he shone, he shone a beam of light uh, through a prism. Uh, and that prism obviously split the light up uh, into the colors of the rainbow. Um, but what he wanted to, 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 to do was to be precise. He, he didn't know um, if the blue that he saw is the same as the blue that everybody else sees. We all call it blue. But, you know, it's that old philosophical question, how do we know? And so what he did was that he did away with the colour. So he did away with the subjective, conscious subjective experience of perception. And what he did was he measured the angle of refraction. So the light comes down one way, it goes through the prism, and, and then it bends. And, and, but some of, the, uh, some of the light wavelengths of light bend more than others. Uh, and this is why we get a rainbow spectrum. And he found that if he measured the difference between the original angle of the white light and the different colors, then he could get a number. And that number would represent the color. So even if the, the blues and the reds that we all see are different from each other, that number always remains the same. And that made color objective. Um, and that is why science measures things, and that's why science doesn't operate on the subjective level. Now, uh, uh, in Buddhism, obviously, the Mahayana, it's sort of the other way around. Uh, the emphasis is on uh, what happens in our subjective experience. Um, and so, therefore, it, it matters as to whether or not we are being deceived. This is what Master Rinzai uh, is actually pointing to. So we have two different ways, again, we have these two different ways of seeing the world. One objective number that can be measured uh, and the other is this uh, subjective uh, experience uh, that becomes primary. So, uh, yeah, there's a nice, um, I mean, a good example of this, uh, uh, for example, uh, yeah, a good example of this, of course, is the Buddha's parable of the rope, uh, of the man this is at the time of the Buddha, who was going along his way. Um, in the evening, it was twilight, on his way back from the fields, uh, and uh, he sees a snake uh, on the road. Now, obviously, this is India, uh, and there are lots of poisonous snakes, about particularly cobras. And so <clears throat> he sort of jumped back in alarm. Uh, but the Buddha was standing there, and the Buddha said to him, look again. So he looked again. And, and uh, peering in that sort of half-light, what he thought was a, a snake, he actually saw was a piece of old rope that someone had discarded along the road. You sort of thing you might expect to see. And, uh, uh, and he went to step over it, and the Buddha said, pick it up. So he picked it up, and as he brought it towards his eyes, he could see that what it was was a string of gems. <sighs> 
The thing is, it had always been a string of champs. Uh, but for because uh, of various uh, uh, concatenations of causes and conditions, it had appeared different three times. So why would that be? Well, we don't know. I mean, the Buddha didn't explain, but it could be, for example, um, that going home in the twilight, perhaps someone had said to him that day, oh, you know, uh, be careful, there are snakes on that road. Uh, and that, even though he might not have been thinking that at the time, he sort of plants a seed um, in us. And, uh, you know, if we see something ambiguous in the half-light that looks sort of snake-shaped, then our imagination, these are the mental configurations, will do the same. So, in fact, in our experience, what we're experiencing, as I said, is not just information coming in passively, but also um, our uh, uh, perception is also an imaginal, is an imaginal act as well. And we receive the result of that as a whole. That is, that is what our perception uh, actually is. So, in fact, what Master Rinzai is saying, even though he says not to be not to be fooled by uh, sounds and smells and so forth, actually it's the mental configurations uh, that become overlaid or entwined with uh, these other uh, uh, configurations uh, that make the difference between seeing clearly uh, and then being obscured. In the case of our man, um, you know, this is, uh, this is why he, he perceived these things differently. The imagination will do that. Um, and I mean, it's the same now if we, if we look at ourselves. You know, we're receiving a lot of propaganda at the moment about social distancing and we're being, you know, the fear's really being pumped up. Um, and just see how it's very, di one of the real difficulties is to, for us, is to actually get a, uh, a picture or a perception of our risk, what risk levels um, uh, we're exposing ourselves to. And of course it's the old thing, where there's a vacuum of information then our imaginations will produce that, it will actually fill those in. And it probably won't be until several months down the road when we will look back and think, oh yes that was a really good idea or actually that made no difference whatsoever, you know. Um, you know, uh, 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 should I have washed my hands for uh, 25 seconds or would it have mattered if I had only washed them for 15? Um, you know, obviously uh, we've been asked to wash them for 20 seconds and so we go along with that advice and that's fine. But again, it's for us it's very difficult to get in with a dearth of information because most of, because we don't know. Uh, it's very difficult and so our imaginations uh, begin to feed into that. And the more frightened we become, uh, then the more threatened we feel. And we begin to do what's called confirmation bias, which is we begin to look for information that confirms what we already feel instinctively. Uh, and that is a very common human trait. And there's a great reason why uh, we often lose perspective uh, in that. And this is why I remember uh, many years ago, Venerable Myokyoni once uh, someone came up to her and told her about a particular scenario that they found difficult at work um, dealing with a, a particular person. Um, and uh, she said, okay, okay. And it was interesting her response because she didn't say, oh, do X, Y, Z. She said, right, go withdraw. As soon as you can, just withdraw. Go somewhere quiet, put the hands together and just bow deeply nine times and bow deeply just the very physical she said don't ask what you're bowing to don't ask to whom you're bowing or whatever just just bow just really sincerely as with as much sincerity as possible give yourself um, into that bow and after you've bowed for nine times she said come up and then look at the situation again she said the situation itself gives you the answer and really what she was pointing to was precisely this, because in that act of giving myself wholeheartedly away into the bowing um, and doing it a number of times to really just loosen that uh, fear, uh, because I am fear is always like palm and back of the hand. Then, you know, this is the clouds are gone uh, and now a little bit more of that um, uh, sunshine, that, that Buddha light uh, comes through and that and that illuminates the situation. And then there's, a, ah, yes, 
there may be just something we have to accept, but then we might see an opportunity. It's, re it's remarkable actually sometimes. We see something uh, that we didn't see and we think, how did I miss that? Well, we missed it because our perception is an act of co-creation and uh, 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 if our imaginations are pumped up with my self-made fears, uh, then it simply blots everything out. This is why it's always about letting go. It's always about emptying out that already full uh, uh, teacup. Okay, well, I think that's enough for now. Uh, I'm going to leave that there. I've spoken for about uh, a half an hour. Thanks for listening. If, if anybody's got any questions or anything, uh, just write them in the comment box. So I'm going to leave this um, running for another couple of minutes. Uh, if nobody's got any questions, then... Uh, we will finish uh, for this week and we'll come back next week. Remember, we will be um, uh, uh, hopefully doing this, all things being equal. We'll continue doing this uh, on a weekly basis for now, Tuesdays at 11 o'clock British summer time. Don't forget also, if you're looking for material, podcasts and all that sort of stuff, you can always find them at uh, www.thezengateway.com. You could even subscribe to our newsletter. I promise we do not bombard you with lots of spam. We just send you uh, a weekly roundup over the weekend of all the things we've been posting up. All quiet on the Western Front. That's good. Well, listen, I, um, I hope very much that you're all okay, that you're not going too stir crazy, that you're managing to get out for your daily constitutional, um, even if it's just a walk around the garden, get, get a breath of fresh air, go and listen to the birds a little bit. Just um, perhaps just a couple of things on our, our current situation. Actually, I've, I've just put up this morning an article from Michael Hashhash on, uh, uh, on the Zen Gateway. Um, about uh, our current predicament and incarceration and so on and so forth. It's sort of worth worth reading. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, you know, this is, um, we may be sort of sit, sat here thinking, oh, well, maybe things will become normal at some point. My pleasure, Maria Elena. Um, uh, uh, maybe things will become normal at some point. Um, but, you know, Maybe in a way we shouldn't be waiting for things to become normal again. Um, maybe uh, a good way is to empty out and look and, and just see the opportunities that um, this space might be giving us at the moment. You know, maybe uh, I'm sure people are reading and, and so forth, but it's a good opportunity if, you, if you've ever wanted to, I mean, after you've cleaned out the kitchen cupboards and done all those sort of things and that gardening that needed doing, um, if there was something that you wanted to learn, or something that you wanted to read, um, it's amazing. One of the lovely things is is people are doing a lot of this, you know, free broadcasts and all this sort of stuff. You know, you can go around and look if you're interested in history or something like that. You know, there's there's so many opportunities now to 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 take advantage of it. We really are blessed. Um, I have to say, imagine doing this 50 years ago. Um, you know, there would have been none of this at all. Uh, so it is very fortunate uh, uh, what we have. Anyway, I think that's uh, probably enough from me. There are no, seem to be no further questions. Thanks very much for coming along, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Uh, stay safe. Thank you very much. Bye bye.